brings me great pleasure, even though I can't say great, great pleasure, uh, to welcome and invite uh, Associate Professor Bob Cowan um, to share some of his insights for what's around the corner for hearing research, treatment and technology. At the end of uh, Bob's talk, there'll be an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, and I'd just like to say enjoy, enjoy the speech. Well, thank you, Jenny, and uh, thank you all for coming out on a cold Melbourne evening. Um, I hope you'll forgive my voice. Uh, uh, I uh, was uh, in Canada a couple of weeks ago and on the way back uh, from 32 degrees to coming into 3 or 4 degrees, perhaps uh, that's where I picked up a bit of this lurgy. Um, so I hope you'll bear with me uh, because of the voice. Um, we are celebrating um, 150 years of uh, the Eye and Ear Hospital, and I think it's important when we do so to recognize that um, that's 150 years of caring and 150 years of establishing a community. Uh, normally I leave my thanks to the end of a presentation, but I thought I'd actually reverse that tonight and uh, give a little bit of thanks uh, at the beginning, because without um, many of the people who I'm going to thank and acknowledge, we wouldn't actually be here, and I certainly wouldn't actually be here. Um, importantly, uh, they say that Australia is the lucky country, and certainly if you do have hearing problems, this is one of the best countries to be in, in terms of the availability of hearing technology, the cost of that technology, and the availability of those services. And that's largely the result of a number of really champions of hearing research. And I just want to acknowledge both uh, the late Dennis Byrne, who was responsible for really uh, putting Australian hearing aid technology and fitting on the map. Um, I'm really proud to say that half of the world's hearing aids are fitted using technology that we've developed in the hearing CRC and uh, has been developed in Australia and is sold from Australia. So that's uh, quite an accomplishment that perhaps many of us don't know about. But importantly, the work of Laureate Professor Graham Clark, who I was delighted to be able to join his group uh, uh, early on in my career, um, has really led the way in the multi-channel cochlear implant technology. Um, and really, Australia's diagnostic and rehabilitative audiological and ENT technologies and services are second to none globally. We lead the world in many areas. And importantly, that's really because of this community that's been established. Um, and in particular, the Eye and Ear Hospital has been a very special community. It's brought together and enabled world-leading research. And I think it's important to acknowledge uh, uh, some of our first uh, cochlear implant patients who took the risk many, many years ago to, uh, to have a, a cochlear implant as an experimental device, and to the Eye and Ear Hospital for taking that lead in allowing this first time in human study to be done. At the time, we all celebrate it now, but at the time it was seen as a very, very risky, high-risk surgery. Um, it's important to reflect on that and the courage of the hospital and the hospital board in taking that on. That world-leading research was, of course, coupled with encouragement for industry to be involved and to participate with the hospital in a long-term development. And we recognize Peter uh, Seligman and Jim Patrick uh, as part of that early team from Graham, uh, who then went on to uh, help to establish Cochlear and the Cochlear technology um, as being uh, the world leaders in the area of Cochlear implantation. Well, that wouldn't have happened without actually having um, a public cochlear implant clinic. And again, the Eye and Ear Hospital led uh, Australia with being the first Australian public cochlear implant clinic providing services to adults and children, established in 1985 as a collaboration between the uh, University of Melbourne and uh, the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital. Um, and uh, many patients benefited from that. We note here Graham uh, uh, Carrick, who was the first recipient of the first commercial device in 1982, and just recently, uh, last year, there was the 30th year anniversary of uh, um, that implantation. 
Um, again, Professor Richard Dell, who was responsible for much of that early clinical work, has gone on as part of that community to be the head of audiology uh, and uh, involved in the cochlear implant clinic here as well. The community also extends to its emphasis on research and teaching. And we recognize the work of uh, uh, Associate Professor Rob Briggs and Professor Stephen O'Leary in continuing that technology development and teaching emphasis, which is really the other important cornerstone of this community. Without developing our next generation of researchers, researchers and clinical professionals, we really can't be confident that the future will uh, uh, be as good as the past. And lastly, and I guess uh, coming uh, importantly to the area that I've been involved with, the INR has always embraced collaboration and recognized that um, it's not just what you can do on your own, it's what you can do when you collaborate effectively with others. And since 1992, the INR Hospital has been a member of the Cooperative Research Center. So we're looking at over 22 years of collaborative research expertise um, and uh, hard work. I also have to give, I think, a little bit of special thanks to the Eye and Ear Hospital. Um, you know, my career has uh, gone a long way. I mean, age four, here I am, a, a budding physiologist in the making. Uh, you can tell I actually like doing presentations then, too. Um, but importantly, I was uh, uh, able to uh, come to Australia in 1982. Uh, and attend uh, one of the first uh, graduate audiology courses. And audiology training, again, uh, first was started at the Eye Near Hospital by Professor Graham Clark and Field Rickards. And um, you won't see me, but I'm actually in there, the guy with the black, the black hair. That's why you won't recognize me. Uh, there's always been strong support for research, and I was, again, lucky enough to be able to do my PhD research with Graham in the Department of Otolaryngology. But again, this, this opportunity wouldn't have happened without the availability of the Eye and Ear Hospital and the support that it gave to not only myself, but many of the people that you've seen in these pictures have done their doctorates through that strong support and community of the Eye and Ear. So that brings us then, I guess, now to uh, uh, the, uh, the meat and potatoes, the Hearing Cooperative Research Center and uh, what we're doing. Uh, Jenny was uh, kind enough to focus on saying, yes, we are going to, to talk a lot about uh, cochlear implants, but improved remediation is only part of the equation. More effective prevention is a key component. It's far better to prevent and less costly to prevent hearing loss in the first place than to remediate it after. And certainly that's a twin challenge for that our hearing CRC is aimed at uh, uh, addressing. Well, why is this important? Um, well, in fact, if we look at prevalence of, uh, of uh, disabilities, hearing loss is the second most uh, common disability in Australia, second only to musculoskeletal disease. Um, currently, one in six Australians have non-normal hearing. That doesn't mean they're deaf. That means they have hearing which is outside of normal limits, just like those of us who use glasses have vision which is outside of normal limits. But importantly, three in four Australians over the age of 70 have significant hearing difficulties which affect them in terms of their ability to communicate and participate in life's uh, uh, activities. Hearing loss in teens and central auditory processing disorders, which affects your ability to make sense of information, are growing problems. Now, much of that noise-related hearing loss may be preventable. And certainly, what we recognize is that many people who could currently benefit from technology don't do so. Well, what does this all mean? Uh, what does it really mean to us? Um, in our uh, current uh, election uh, period, we're all concerned about economics, aren't we? And uh, getting the true economics. Well, hearing loss costs Australia $11 billion a year in, in lost productivity in particular. And if we think about over half of that, 57% of that is lost productivity from people either not being able to be employed or be empl uh, being employed in lower paying jobs, um, it's a significant uh, problem uh, for retraining people uh, from our defense forces, from the CFA, uh, people who have to stop doing the work they're doing because of noise-induced hearing loss. So it's a significant problem for us. And it's a growing problem. It isn't just work-related noise that's a problem. We need to recognize that leisure noise makes a major contribution. I keep uh, trying to explain to... Uh, to people that uh, they should think about hearing loss like they think about sunburn. It's a combination of 
how intense the sun is, how long you're in it, and how frequently you're in it. And noise-induced hearing loss is exactly the same. It's how loud the sound is, how long you're exposed to it, and how frequently you're exposed to it. So it's a combination of things that we need to be concerned about. And if we think about uh, um, our lifelong hearing journey, what we recognize is that uh, um, as we age, we're going to have um, some effects from work over our, our period of time uh, in terms of our exposure to loud sound. But one of the things that we're very concerned about is the exposure of young people. Uh, the Hearing CRC and Australian Hearing did a study which we called binge listening, um, which I think the name was very evocative of what the concern was. And what we were finding was that in one night, um, teens at a club might have the equivalent of three weeks noise exposure from a work-related environment. Um, if I employ you and I put you in a noisy environment uh, of uh, sounds above 85 decibels, I need to provide you with hearing protection. Um, the decibel scale is a logarithmic scale. Every 6 dB is twice as loud. So if we think 91 dB is twice as loud as 85. The average sounds that we found in, in a wide range of clubs that we uh, sampled was around 110 decibels. So if uh, I employed you to go to the club, I'd have to give you hearing protection. So you think about that, and uh, certainly perhaps some legislative changes that uh, perhaps require venues to give out uh, $2.50 hearing protection at the door might not be a bad idea. Um, but certainly a, a fix is needed in this area. Because hearing loss is cumulative. Um, here we, we demonstrate this by showing there's the loss that's occurring in clubbing. And you only club till you're about 30, perhaps, maybe not that long, and then you stop. And so that amount of hearing loss stops, uh, and it just goes along. Uh, you know, it, you don't get any more damage from the clubbing. Your work-related life and leisure exposure keeps going up over time. But if you think about when you put those together, instead of having a curve that's following, in terms of hearing loss, the blue line, you now have a curve that's following the amber line. So what we see is that we end up lifelong in a far worse hearing situation because of this combination of both work and age-related hearing loss plus the effects of clubbing. Does that mean people shouldn't club? No, it means they should think about how long they're there and protecting their hearing. But this is a bit of a scary graph because what we look at is uh, um, looking at the predictions for Australians with hearing loss per year of age, numbers, and here we see currently 3.1 million or about 14% in 2009, and this is the projection for 2020, and this is the projection for 2030. So what we can see is that we're getting increasing numbers of people with a hearing loss. Well, this is consistent with an aging population and a longer lifespan. But the worrying thing is that we're getting increased numbers of aged people with hearing loss. And that certainly has to change the way we do management and the way we provide services. So hearing loss management in the future, the kinds of things that the eye and ear hospital and care agencies do, will have to change. The World Health Organization currently estimates that 15% of the world's adult population have some hearing loss and 25% of those over the age of 65 or older have a hearing loss that uh, affects communication. Now, we need to think that uh, there are two parts to this uh, effect of communication. The first is the effect of loss of acuity, so our ability to detect sound. And here we see an audiogram, which is the standard measure that we do at the eye and ear in terms of uh, looking at uh, what level of hearing does someone have. We see frequency across the top in terms of the different uh, speech sounds, and here we see increase in intensity. And depending on where the thresholds fall for the right and left ear, we then get an idea of the degree of hearing loss and the reduced access to acoustic information that an individual has. So this is how we think about in terms of hearing thresholds. But what's the so what factor? Okay, uh, This is just hearing beeps and bops. The so what factor is on this graphic, which again shows frequency and intensity, but now I've put the sounds of speech on this graphic for you. We have the vowel sounds, which are quite loud, ooh, ah, e. The consonant sounds, which are quite soft. If you think about the unvoiced th in the word thin, it's a very soft sound. It doesn't take much of a hearing loss for you to lose it. Um, and the effect of a hearing loss, then, is to make more and more of the speech sounds inaudible. So you may hear the vowel sounds, but you don't hear the consonants. You can't then tell one word from another. It sounds like mumbling. 
and you may have had, uh, certainly I had in my past, my grandfather who was a farmer who drove on muffled tractors all his life. You know, I can remember him lecturing me, Bobby, you'll never be a man till you can speak clearly, boy. You know, speak up, speak clearly. Uh, where he had a raging high frequency hearing loss, and of course, to him, I was mumbling. Um, whereas really, it was his hearing loss. So the effect of what we're after with rehabilitation and remediation and intervention is actually either to prevent this hearing loss happening through education or to improve communication by making more of that speech sound available. We're not actually fixing hearing loss. We're not actually curing this kind of hearing loss. Well, you know, every day um, we also need to recognize that, um, to be honest, government uh, and many of our agencies have the model of hearing loss wrong. They think it's like vision. They think it's a peripheral problem, and if we just slap on a device, that's going to fix the problem up. But that's not the way hearing loss works. Uh, when we start to lose uh, our sense cells, we also start to lose some of the processing capability. We start to see uh, changes to the neural pathways, to the actual transmission of sound to the brain. And this is demonstrated by research that we've done, which shows that as the degree of hearing loss goes up, what we see is the degree of auditory processing disorder also goes up. The more hearing loss you have, the more difficult it is for you to make sense of information that's given to you, even when it's restored. But they're two different things. Putting a device on only restores access to sound. It doesn't help you to work out how to process it. And this is partly the explanation why people say, oh yeah, I've got a hearing aid, but it doesn't help me. It sits in my top drawer. Well, maybe they haven't done enough rehabilitation to actually learn to use that information. And this is a key thing that we need to focus on uh, in the future, is making sure people get that adequate rehabilitation. Well, what about a genetic fix? You know, we read every day about new genes and, and new technologies. Isn't, isn't a, a genetic fix going to just cure hearing loss? Well, there have been actually some very encouraging developments in our Hearing Cooperative Research Center. We've actually developed a number of um, uh, uh, mice pathways or, or mice that are, um, have particular susceptibility either to noise-induced hearing loss or to early-onset hearing loss, um, mimicking aging. And by exploring that, we can look at what genes activate the, the loss of hair cells, uh, what proteins are involved, and what then causes the loss of those hair cells. We can then look at the potential to have a drug that mimics the effect on genes. So in the future, there may well be a molecular therapeutic that might work for some types of hearing loss. And we've had some encouraging developments uh, um, in this area in terms of uh, identifying therapeutics. But this is a long way off. The average time of development for drugs uh, uh, of in uh, any sort of technology uh, applied to people is 15 to 20 years. So we're not talking about something that's around the corner. But it is encouraging to see that there have been some developments coming from uh, cancer research or other uh, areas. So we're left with remediation by technology. And what's important is that that range of technology is actually getting better. Uh, when I first started in audiology, you used a hearing aid to you couldn't use it anymore, and then you used a cochlear implant. Um, it was a very simple black and white dividing line. You really needed to have a total hearing loss before going to an implant. Um, it's not quite so black and white anymore, and in fact, we have lots more choice. Um, but if we think about what does an actual device do, how does it actually work? And that helps us to better understand what our research is doing. Um, currently, everyone's hearing me okay? Yeah? Hands up? Everyone hearing me? Good. That means the sound is coming through the air to you. It's being picked up by through your uh, transmission mechanisms, going down, moving the eardrum. That's then passing information to the cochlea, exciting the hair cells. That's passing up uh, your eighth nerve and getting to your temporal lobe where you are detecting auditory sensations. Now, because you all speak English, you're able to then to make sense of that in terms of speech comprehension. And because your brain is particularly smart, you're able to work out that this guy speaking with a non-Australian accent, you can actually work those words out as well. Um, what we recognize is that speech is related to articulation. Uh, when I first came to Australia and started working with implant, uh, uh, with implant uh, patients and, and tactile patients, I s tried to change my vowels um, to Australianize them. 
Uh, and after about uh, uh, four weeks or five weeks, uh, I had a deputation come from the patients to say, we don't know what you're doing, but whatever you're doing, cut it out. Um, you're, you're big before we could understand you, but now you're getting indecipherable. So blame it on the patients that I still speak like a North American. Um, but importantly, uh, we learn to interpret these auditory sensations as speech comprehension. Now, si qui pensent les si qui parle en français? No, no, merveilleux. Now everyone heard that, but of course the auditory sensations are getting there. But we need to actually learn that as language, and we learn that in each language we hear. Okay, and this will be important when we come back to uh, thinking about kitties in a minute. So if we think, well, what does a hearing aid do? Well, a hearing aid, in fact, tries to recognize that we have a problem in either the transmission pathway or in the sense cell, and we try and pre-program the speech or pre-amplify the speech to deal with it. And then we just stick it back in and we use the normal, the pathway that's there for the person. So we either try and overcome a conductive hearing loss by amplifying it, or a sensory neural hearing loss by amplifying particular components of the speech. But it's acoustic information. It's using your acoustic signal. So if we think about, well, what's the effect of that? That's the effect of taking hearing loss uh, thresholds, say, that are here from a severe hearing loss and restoring them up to this sort of level. So we're making a lot more of the speech sounds accessible to people, but not necessarily all of them. There's a limit to how loud we can make the sound without damaging someone's hearing. Okay? So the effect of a hearing aid is to amplify the sounds to increase the range that is audible, but it's an acoustic signal. And what we see in terms of, of where hearing aid technology is going is a certainly a, uh, a focus on uh, improving signal in noise, so improving the ability to perceive in background noise through super directional microphones. Um, but importantly, we need to recognize that hearing aids are a very large uh, business. It's 7.2 billion in 2011, expected to grow significantly over the next uh, three years. But um, the World Health Organization last year estimated that current production of hearing aids meets less than 10% of global demand. And probably in developing countries, we're pretty good in Australia, but in developing countries, probably less than 3% of people who need a hearing aid have one or can have one fitted. Because this is the other graphic that goes with that, which shows audiologists per million people. Um, Brazil is the best represented in terms of they have bajillions of audiologists. Um, and uh, I won't go into that any further. They have lots and lots of audiologists. Australia is pretty well represented <coughs> for audiologists as well. As you can see, we have a pretty good representation in terms of uh, audiologists per million people. But if you think about trying to pre present services in South Africa, in uh, South America, or in particular in uh, Asia Pacific, it's a completely different situation. Not only do we not have access to technology, we don't have access to technologists who can actually provide those services. So this is both an opportunity for us in Australia and a challenge. So what can we do about this? Well, we test people's hearing with an audiometer. And uh, when we test them, uh, we then work out what we should put into a hearing aid, which is a prescription formula that we've developed. Uh, we then need to couple that to a particular kind of uh, coupler, and it may be just an open dome, uh, and uh, add something that can adjust the hearing aid on the front end. Um, when we do all of this, we really need to be aware of how loud the sound is around us so that we are ensuring that uh, the levels that we're testing have actually been accurate. But if we take all of that stuff and we add in the ability of the individual to then test themselves using Bekashi audiometry so they can actually measure when they hear it and don't, we can actually build all of that inside a hearing aid. So we can actually have a device which is a self-fitting hearing aid. And this is not something using the internet. It's something that you take out, put in your ear, it tests your hearing, it does a first fit, and Bob's your uncle. There you are, you have a, a self-fitting hearing aid. Um, in particular, uh, as we said, it's useful in developing countries, or what we're looking at is open access in developing countries where we have uh, uh, not many audiologists. And, and certainly this is a concept that we've uh, proven already and we're currently in development of. And so Australia can again be leading in terms of providing services on a global basis, uh, providing these to this uh, kind of technology to developing countries. And this is certainly something that's happening now and will happen. Well, okay, 
how about our focus on cochlear implants? After all, that's one of our um, real achievements. So, um, first of all, what is a, complex, uh, a, a cochlear implant? And obviously, it's a complex man-machine system. We have a, a technology, and that technology needs to be married up to the individual needs of a particular person, be it an adult or a child, because all hearing losses are individual. We've seen a lot of development in cochlear implant technology uh, over the last 20 years. And here we see the implantable components um, and their development over time, the electrode arrays just down in here. And we see the developments in speech processing. And what's evident is we've gone from uh, a body-worn type device to more of an ear-level type device. And this is the external component, and this is the internal component. And when you compare other technologies, uh, uh, the nucleus technology with um, the other main technologies worldwide, you see there's a remarkable similarity between them. They all use the same basic concepts of an implantable technology, an external speech processor, and more and more uh, what we call a remote assistant or a uh, external programmable device which can change what's happening at the ear level. And the technologies, as you can see, there's a convergence in the technologies. Partially, this is because some of the original patents are running out. So uh, people can actually move into areas where perhaps they couldn't. But it's also because we're recognizing that some of the technologies work better than others. But what does an implant do? We talked about a hearing aid. Well, what's the difference with an implant? Well, an implant bypasses all of this um, transmission of the ear mechanics, uh, movement of the uh, eardrum, or stimulation of the hair cells in the cochlea itself, it directly stimulates the spiral ganglion cells of the eighth nerve. So it's stimulating the start of the auditory nerve. It's bypassing all of this information or all of this uh, section of the, uh, uh, of the auditory pathway. So it really doesn't matter what the damage is here. We're bypassing it. Um, but importantly, it's not acoustic. It's not a hearing aid. It doesn't present what a hearing aid does. It's a different kind of uh, presentation. It's electric. Now, if you recall, I said that we learned auditory sensations and we learned to interpret those in terms of speech comprehension, in terms of the languages that we have learned. Well, certainly if we have an adult who has an acquired hearing loss, they have this learning of auditory sensations to speech comprehension, and that's why we see adults doing very well relatively shortly after implants. The majority do quite well because we're just, um, we use this uh, training that's happened. In children, it's quite different. They have to learn to listen through their implant and to learn speech through their implant. And we have demonstrated that that's actually very effectively done. We have children who can speak more than one language, who can actually uh, play piano, who, who have an appreciation of music, not what we hear, but an appreciation of music that allows them to participate in things uh, musical. And what's the effect of an implant? Well, that's to take uh, hearing thresholds of this sort of level and restore them, again, communication ability back up to that sort of level. Again, making speech sounds accessible, but through electrical stimulation, not acoustically. And that explains why most implant patients will say to you, music does not sound like what I remember. Okay, it sounds different because it's not acoustic, it's electric stimulation. It doesn't sound the same. Um, many years ago, I once asked uh, Sophie Lee, who you'll know is the daughter of Kunshin Lee, um, Sophie has bilateral cochlear implants, and I'd asked her to open uh, an ASA conference in Perth. And uh, uh, just before I was asking her, um, um, you know, being an interested researcher, I asked her, what does music sound like to you, Sophie? And she looked at me and said, that's a really stupid question. <laughs> um, I've never heard what my parents have hear. I've heard through an implant, it allows me to play the piano, it allows me to do, you know, what I do. but." I have no idea what music sounds like to other people, only what it sounds like to me. And that, was, to me, was a real learning experience, uh, um, noting to me that uh, our patients are an important part of our research program, and we do need to talk to them a lot um, to understand what's really happening in real life. All right, and more and more, actually, we're now seeing a situation where we've gotten even more complex because we're now able to combine acoustic stimulation with electric stimulation in the same ear. So no longer do we have a situation where it's an either-or. We now have a situation where it can be both. Um, and we can best use this for individuals. So we're recognizing that cochlear implants are, in fact, um, one of the most successful medical bionic prosthetics. 
and many of the technologies that we've been developing now have now been lent over to the bionic eye, and it's delightful to see the progress that's being made there. But I guess uh, that raises this rhetor rhetorical question about if implants are so good, why do we need to spend anything more on research? What, what are the problems? And certainly we do have some issues. Um, I promise you, not a lot of graphs here, so just bear with me on just uh, this graphic, which shows you um, really a, a spread of adult patients using the Freedom Cochlear Implant. And these are patients who have acquired deafness after they have learned to uh, speak um, and, and learned language. A and these are ones who, uh, prelingual, uh, they acquire their deafness prior to. What you can see is that uh, with adult patients, while a majority do extremely well, this is looking at 75% correct on a sentence test, um, and our median score is about 85%, you can see that the, while the majority do extremely well, we still have some unexplained variance. We still don't get that kind of result with all patients, and in particular with ones who are prelingually hearing impaired. So this is an area that we need to really concentrate on as well um, as soon as we put uh, a cochlear implant or a hearing aid user into background noise, the performance drops very quickly. The effect, kind of like the effect of you going to uh, uh, a very noisy restaurant. And I thought it was interesting that the restaurant um, industry just asked for the noise levels in restaurants to be raised to 100 decibels. Um, kind of absurd uh, uh, approach. Um, but uh, again, each one of us can make a difference. Uh, you know, if you as an individual don't like how noisy it is, ask them to turn it down. Um, you know, you're the customer. All right, so what do we need to focus on and what are we focusing on? Um, to think about uh, what our research uh, or where our research is focused, we can think about the hearing healthcare chain from the client through the technology, the clinical process, the intervention, and then the translational work that needs to be done to make sure that professionals actually apply those outcomes. Well, certainly we need to better understand how language is processed. How do we actually process language? And it's hard to look because it's a bit of a black box. We see what comes in, we see what comes out, but it's hard to see what's going on in there. Um, one of the ways that we're doing this now is to look at what's called magnetoencephalographic imaging, um, which allows us to look at the time course of information as it's processed within the auditory system in adults and with children. Um, this is uses, uh, records the magnetic waves that are uh, um, in the brain, and we can actually use this to look at what areas of the brain are being activated. Um, and here's some work that we've been doing comparing English with Mandarin Chinese, which is a tonal language, to see, well, are the same areas of the brain activated um, in these two di very different kinds of languages? And this kind of information gives us a, a leg up in terms of how we should be designing speech processing strategies um, for uh, tonal languages like Mandarin Chinese, which is, uh, I think, um, a third uh, of the world's people speak tonal languages, and it's certainly a growing number in Australia. A key thing that's changed over the last uh, period of time is the kind of patients we're seeing. In the 1980s, this again is an, an aided audiogram. Uh, this yellow area is the speech area, and what we can see is in the 1980s, really, uh, you had to have a total hearing loss to have a cochlear implant. Um, with hearing aids, you would be getting no information within the speech range. Whereas now in 2000, we're actually seeing uh, patients who have a significant amount of low frequency residual hearing um, and in fact may have unilateral deafness. Okay, they may hear quite well in one ear and just be deaf in one side. And patients are changing from the situation of just having one implant to possibly having an implant with a hearing aid in the other ear, having two implants bilaterally, or having a hybrid with an acoustic and electric implant in one ear with a hearing aid or a cochlear implant in the other. So a situation where we're certainly looking at uh, no longer monaural fitting of devices, but uh, binaural fitting of devices. Well, that implies that we're getting patients with more preoperative uh, residual hearing coming to us as implant uh, candidates, and that's certainly the case. This shows you the preoperative hearing levels from uh, a selected group of, uh, just an, sorry, an unselected group of, of subjects uh, in the eye and ear hospital uh, group, and here we see that's again frequency and that's intensity. And you can see these, these uh, individuals have a lot of low frequency um, hearing information uh, that we'd want to preserve uh, using a, an implant. <laughs> so certainly our focus in, in developing cochlear implants and in electro design has been on preserving those internal cochlear structures. Here you see a cross section through the cochlea. Um, that's the basilar membrane, which the hearing organ sits on top of. 
the nerve cells that we're trying to stimulate are here in the mid area, and this is uh, going in a turn, coming around and spiraling up like a snail shell. So what we're trying to do is make sure that we can put an electrode here without damaging that Bowser membrane. And certainly Rob Briggs and the, uh, the electrode development team are uh, keenly involved with cochlear in all of its uh, development of new electrode arrays. And here we see the contour advanced electrode array, which is the electrode array that's used most of all uh, electrode arrays worldwide uh, for cochlear implants up to date. And here we see other new technology, uh, a modiola research array that we've been developing at the eye and ear. So we've moved from uh, these, uh, this shows some electrode development over time. This was your original uh, cochlear implant electrode. The contour advanced, which you can see is quite a big electrode. And you can see that uh, current technology has been going to shorter electrodes and thinner electrodes to uh, try and reduce uh, the possibility of trauma in surgery. And here we see some results of pre versus post-operative thresholds. Um, so after cochlear implant surgery uh, with uh, using this is the uh, slim straight electrode. Um, and we can see that we're getting reasonably good preservation of residual hearing uh, in uh, uh, a select group of patients using this technology. And there we see the MRA, just uh, again to, uh, to highlight some of the technologies and, and how we change those technologies. Um, moving from uh, a uh, lumen with a sheath, uh, with a stilet down the middle that holds it straight, to a sheath. And this was to actually try and make it easier for surgeons to uh, implant uh, these devices, particular in uh, Asia Pacific, where the ENT training uh, may not have as much temporal bone work. Okay. Well, the whole concept behind this is that uh, really you are using a uh, hearing aid or acoustic information to stimulate low frequencies and cochlear implant technology to stimulate the high frequencies, or so electrical stimulation and acoustic stimulation. Well, does it actually work? Does it actually make a difference? Um, and here what we can see is this is preoperative word scores from 0 to 100 using hearing aids, and this is postoperative word scores. And first of all, we just have the cochlear implant. Now, if the scores were equal, they'd be right along this line. The fact that they're all up here indicates that the cochlear implant is certainly across a wide range of studies being of significant benefit over the use of bilateral hearing aids preoperatively. Um, and certainly word scores are better postoperatively than they were with hearing aids. And the difference is a benefit of about 30 to 34 percent across a wide range of studies. Well, what happens when we add the acoustic information in to that uh, same ear? What we see is that we get again, an additional bit of benefit in terms of word perception scores. Um, and that changes from our 30 to 34 percent range up to about 43 to 50 percent uh, improvement using an implant alone, again, across a wide range of studies. So being able to provide both acoustic and electric stimulation in the same ear has been a, a real uh, change to the way cochlear implant technology is uh, going. But what's happening in the future? Well, importantly, if uh, you follow the technology, um, Apple filed a U.S. patent on February the 7th of this year for a system that automatically detects a hearing aid. And when it detects that hearing aid, it changes its transmission from being acoustic to um, RF transmission. So your Apple iPhone will recognize you're a hearing aid user and automatically change itself to suit you. The future is definitely looking at having these kind of applications. And the dominant device for people with mild to moderate hearing loss in the future may not, in fact, be a behind-the-ear hearing aid. It may be a hearing aid combined with a hands-free device or their mobile phone or a tablet device that sends information to them um, to their ear-level processor. Uh, and certainly, we've seen that already with, uh, as I mentioned, uh, a number of the cochlear implants having these cochlear remote, uh, these remote assistants that are picking up information and being able to transmit that uh, so your phone can come into it, your iTunes can come into it. Really a, a completely different situation in terms of this ease of use and um, connectivity between devices. Uh, how many of you have a mobile phone? Yeah, I rest my case. Um, this is the way of the future, certainly. But ease of use is a key thing as well. And uh, when we thought about our cochlear implant patients, um, I mentioned to you that we don't cure deafness. So as soon as you take your cochlear implant or hearing aid off, you revert to the situation you were pre-device. And in the case of a cochlear implant, uh, if you think about at night, I know certainly my 11-year-old uh, my uh, woke up at about 3 a.m. last night with a sore throat, and instantly I was awake. 
I heard him from the other end of the house. If you're deaf, that doesn't happen. Right? Um, you may not be able to hear alarms. Uh, we live in a, in a country that's great with beaches, isn't it? Um, but you can't wear your implant when you swim or surf. Um, you can't even wear it in the shower. Uh, and if you think about children, where do a lot of children learn their language? In the bathtub, right? When they're being washed as little children. Uh, well, again, it's very hard to have your implant on your child in the bath. That doesn't happen. So being able to actually um, do those sorts of things, use a, uh, an implant in wet environments or for sports or nighttime use, could be a key thing. Now, m several years ago now, this research is quite old, um, the Eye and Ear Hospital, uh, again led by Rob uh, Briggs, uh, we did a study of the first world's first totally implanted cochlear implant. Uh, and the difference here was that we had an implantable microphone in the actual receiver stimulator that was implanted, and we had a uh, battery that was uh, uh, on board. So we had a rechargeable battery that was in the package and an implantable microphone. So this was meant to be used as an auxiliary. During the day, you wore your normal speech processor. That charged up the rechargeable battery. You took the processor off, and you could be listening to invisible hearing through a subcutaneous microphone. Did it work? Yes, it did work. Um, what we found was that this was showing uh, the external processor, this was invisible hearing, and what we can see is that, yes, uh, people could hear using that subcutaneous microphone, but it was at a lower level. But that's what we anticipated it would be. So why don't we see these around now? Uh, because we had a problem, and the problem was body noise. Um, kind of the, the effect of you doing that with your fingers or at night on, you can hear, sometimes hear your blood pumping at night when you sealed your ear canal uh, on the pillow. Uh, this was uh, an issue that happened with all of our patients. <laughs> but when we actually look at the, I just pulled out one patient here. We did three patients. Um, they're all still using their uh, Tiki devices. Um, and interestingly, this shows you when their Esprit in blue, when their Esprit 3G was used. This shows you when their invisible hearing was used. This was day, this was night. And what you can see with this patient is they're always listening. They're always able to hear. And that's ultimately what we want, the ease of listening. The things that you and I take for granted, we want to make available to implant patients in the future, to make it easy for them. Uh, importantly, we thought our, our rechargeable batteries might last for about seven years, but current statistics indicate to us that uh, um, this shows you the battery, uh, uh, projected battery life for our three subjects. We think that, uh, that those batteries may now last, rechargeable batteries may last out to 15 years, um, which is pretty, uh, pretty good uh, in terms of the technology. I just want to finish up in thinking about the electroneural interface. Um, we have an electrode array which is actually inserted into the cochlea, and I mentioned to you that we want to stimulate the auditory nerve cell bodies. And you may have seen diagrams in uh, textbooks that look kind of look like this. We, we put out an electric charge, and it kind of looks like a flashlight beam and comes out and, and stimulates the cell bodies. But that's not actually what happens. Uh, it doesn't work that way physiologically um, because the cochlea is a charged environment. Um, it's electrically charged. It carries a, a voltage in it, okay? It's not just saline or, or, or water. It's electrically active. So when you pass electricity through an electrically active medium, um, it changes, okay? We also recognize that uh, um, very soon after implantation, we get a sheath forming around the cochlear implant, which is good because we want to seal it off from the, the middle ear so we prevent infection. That's important. But if this gets too big, it can affect then and that cause problems in terms of the spread of that electrical current. Um, so many of the things that we're trying to do are trying to modulate this uh, degree of spread of current and control the amount of fibrous tissue. Because what we know is and this, this is a good situation. In this kind of situation where we see a lot of new bone and fibrous tissue forming, we have high impedance. So we have high resistance to electrical flow. And that's a problem for us. So one way of, getting, uh, of dealing with that is to use a corticosteroid or something that controls uh, inflammation. Well, how do we get it into the cochlea? Well, one thing that we can do is we can uh, impregnate the silicon that actually forms the carrier of the electrode array with uh, a corticosteroid like dexamethasone, for example, and we can allow that to diffuse off the surface out into the cochlear environment. Um, does this work? Well, actually, yes, it works quite well. This shows you graphics of the amount of... Uh, of decks that can be delivered from 0 to 50 percent, and the time course from 0 days up to 100 days. And depending on the uh, concentration of uh, decks that we use and the way we mix it, 
we can get delivery levels uh, by passive diffusion up to about 50% of the, uh, the decks that we load over a period from 80 to 100 days. So we can control minute amounts of drug delivery to the cochlea uh, over an extended period of time. And this is a very exciting uh, technology which is just entering our, our pilot stages of first time in human studies, again at the Eye and Ear Hospital, which leads our technology development uh, in all of these new technologies. This relies on inherently conductive polymers, and there's many technologies that uh, we can uh, do, not only uh, improving impedance or electrical uh, uh, transfer, managing tissue response, but potentially building electrodes in different ways so we can provide more uh, intricate uh, or more detailed stimulation. Well, when I first graduated in audiology, um, I got my graduation screwdriver. Uh, and this is how we managed hearing aids. Um, basically, you opened a trim pot and you, you adjusted them. <coughs> this was high technology in the 90s. Um, well, now this is how we fit cochlear implants uh, and uh, hearing aids. We use uh, programming, uh, and it's had the net effect of increasing the time it takes us to program patients. Um, it's not quite so simple as switching a, a, a few dials. Uh, but importantly, we need to then think, uh, are we going to be able to continue to have one-to-one -one adjustment uh, of audiologists for uh, each patient in terms of their hearing aid prescriptions or cochlear implant prescriptions? The answer is probably no. So we have to develop other technologies. One is approach that we've developed as a trainable hearing aid where we actually uh, involve the user in self-adjusting their own device and recording that into an onboard computer. Um, so uh, recording training to their selected preferences. Uh, when this goes then into live mode, um, what happens is as the individual moves around, the hearing aid recognizes the acoustic environment and recognizes the selected preference and adjusts the hearing aid accordingly for that individual. Does it make a difference? Well, yes, it appears to make a difference both in terms of speech clarity and sound comfort. And it's been released commercially by Siemens, uh, and we're now looking at implementing this in a cochlear implant. You probably have seen um, in the, in the uh, papers uh, information about, well, you can now get a hearing aid, you can buy it over the Internet, and you can get it programmed across uh, the Internet. Well, certainly the Internet can be a disruptive technology, and certainly audiologists need to recognize that the, the direct-to-consumer hearing instrument sales aren't going to go away. Um, but we think there's a better way to actually manage this, and that's to actually manage this using uh, a remote peer-to-peer uh, -peer setup where we actually have professionals that are um, online, um, you know, in our, uh, our clinics that are able then to work with patients remotely and so supervise and oversee what they're doing remotely in terms of fitting hearing aids and uh, fitting implants. We think this is a better kind of model. Uh, we've actually demonstrated that it's able to work. Here's our clinician sitting in Sydney and this child sitting in Samoa. Um, so we're able to program, basically we're programming the child's cochlear implant across the Pacific Ocean. Um, in real time. So this technology is available. It's certainly something that we're going to be using to help with uh, developing countries. Now, importantly, we have just started to, uh, we haven't mentioned yet intervention, and intervention or habilitation in children is critically important. Um, five years ago, we commenced the world's first long-term study of 450 children who were following right through and will follow right through from birth to teenage years um, using hearing aids and cochlear implants. We have uh, 450 children. Um, currently, we've uh, collected the third-year data and have just now started to finish off the five-year data. So we've been following these children and assessing a, a wide range of outcomes uh, for them. Eventually, we want to look and see what are the educational and employment outcomes for these kids. The key factor that's coming out of this, the main key factor, is age at fitting. And certainly, what we're seeing is that if you're fitting children under the age of six months, they're within one standard deviation of the norm in terms of global outcomes. So early fitting is critical. That doesn't mean that if you fit later, it doesn't work. It means you do get a better outcome if you fit early. Uh, that means we have to have universal newborn screening because there's no other way to pick up children and deal with them. And we're lucky in Australia to have it, and we need to make sure that we keep it. Um, there's always challenges to funding for dollars, and uh, certainly universal newborn screening is a key thing. Fitting age is the critical issue. Uh, when we look at global language outcomes for that group of 150 children, this is the sort of global outcome that we see. Uh, we can see this is a distribution of uh, their, their scores. This is the number of kids. 
Um, and on this, when we look at our normal hearing children, this is where they would fall in terms of that kind of spread on these kinds of uh, global tests. So you can see that the two populations overlap each other, right? Um, we have some children who are actually performing as good as uh, some of the very good normal hearing children. But it's a range, and those ranges overlap. Key factors are children with more hearing, an early age of implantation, maternal education, and I'm afraid to say girls do better than boys. <laughs> um, additional factors that, uh, uh, that can cause problems are additional disabilities and low birth weight. So if we have universal newborn screening, that means we have to be able to fit hearing aids very early. It means we need an evaluation method to, to show that what we've been doing is actually working properly in terms of the fitting of an implant or a hearing aid. We can fine tune them and we can make these decisions about whether in fact an implant is needed. So again with our research we've been developing technology using cortical auditory evoked potentials where we put a sound in and we record the electrical response of the brain to that sound um, using speech stimuli and we've developed HearLab which has now been commercialized uh, and is uh, available worldwide and that's used to fit hearing aids in infants and importantly will now be used more frequently in elderly aged patients with cognitive decline. And this is a really critical area for you. Would it shock you if I told you that, the, the, that um, there is no requirement for people entering aged care to have a hearing, let alone a communication assessment? But yet everything that's done with them involves auditory information and communication. But we don't assess it. And to me, that's something that we really should be focusing on as, as a very important thing. And why cortical auditory evoked potentials? Because they can actually be generated in response to sound stimuli. Um, HearLab doesn't require skilled electrophysiologists. It can be used by uh, any uh, trained uh, technologist, so we can use it in, in remote and rural settings. Um, and it can encourage people to be involved in hearing healthcare rurally and remoting. It can be used for hearing, hitting a hearing aids, Baja or cochlear implants, and it can be used without sedation, which is really uh, a big change from the other technologies that were available up till now. I just want to close by saying we believe that uh, teaching and learning is, is, is the critical end game here. It isn't just about developing research, it's making sure that we put it in people's hands so they actually apply it. And that's GPs, the public, ENTs, speech pathologists, audiologists. So the Hearing CRC and its member partners, including the INEAR, have invested heavily in HearNet and HearNet Learning. Um, HearNet Learning is, if it comes up, should come up, uh, uh, page down. Yeah, HearNet Learning uh, is an online training uh, uh, modules that are used for continuing professional development and are available to, to uh, support audiologists uh, both in metropolitan and uh, uh, remote regional settings. Um, and currently we have some 600, nearly 600, over 600? Over 500, oh yeah, well I always push it a bit. Uh, <laughs> over 500 uh, registered users of, uh, who are getting their uh, training uh, on uh, hearing aids, directional microphones, and other modules uh, of technology. This lets us ensure that not only are we able to translate that information, but again that people realize that the eye and ear and its member parties are actually still leading hearing research in Australia. So we covered a wide range of technologies in terms of what we do with research, from the client through the technology, the clinical process, the intervention, and importantly, the outcomes. I'd just like to thank the INEAR and you for the opportunity to present this to you and give you my best wishes for the next 150 years. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Uh, look, I never, ever cease to be amazed at the brain's trust that exists with our partners for hearing health. You know, and I give you Bob Cowan. I'm tired even listening to him. Um, we've got the opportunity to open up to the floor now. So um, we haven't actually got a roaming mic, but what we do have is a very... Uh, <laughs> and we're at the Hearing CRC, and I'm assuming this is all acoustically sound. Good. So, um, have we got any questions? Yes, look, I, I was very interested in what you were saying about uh, putting implants in people, or properly implants in people that had some residual hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, and you said, you gave the example of a person who had never had any hearing and did a profound research, and, and you said, what does the sound sound like? I was wondering what it sounded like to people who have 
So some of these things really, I mean, for example, if you look at the music, as it sounds, it's still provocative. Well, I think we, we did discuss that a, a little bit, or I alluded to that, that um, cochlear implants provide an electrical signal, not an acoustic signal. So it actually sounds quite different to the normal timbre of uh, a musical instrument, say, for example. Uh, what are implant patients who use both acoustic and